And the home of the brave play ball! Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, this episode is coming out on May 13th. That's Kelly's birthday. Happy birthday, Kelly! Or should I say my friends? Which still feels wild to say. First, there are a lot of fun opportunities to see me live with a bunch of multitude people as well. I've already talked about us being at PodX in Nashville for June 1st and 2nd, as well as our live shows in Brooklyn in June and in Boston in October, but there's two new opportunities that I get to talk about. First, I will be joining some multitude folks to do a dry run of Dungeons and Dragons in reality. It's a real play Dungeons and Dragons thing we're going to do at PodX, but we're doing a dry run of it here in New York City on May 18th. That is this Saturday at 7 p.m. at 20 Sided Store in Brooklyn. Basically, the whole premise is us playing D&D, but as ourselves in an extremely high stakes escape room. I'm really excited about it. It's going to be fun if you're in the New York City area. Come through. It'll be a fun time. And also, In August, I, as well as some other fine folks from Multitude, will be at Podcast Movement. There will be a Potterless live show where I'm going to talk about the theme parks. I'm very excited, and we're going to be involved in some other panels. Those details have not been set in stone yet, but I know Podcast Movement has deals if you buy tickets early, so if you're on the fence about going and Multitude slash me is what puts you over that fence, come on through. I'm going to be there. It'll be fun. And of course, we will do meetups in Orlando as well. All of the information for these events can be found at multitude.productions slash live. So go check it out, and hopefully I'll see your faces there. And just a friendly reminder that one of those Multitude shows is Horace. I work on it, and I co-host it with Eric Silver. It's very fun. It's about basketball, but not really. It's a podcast where the whole thesis statement is to show that basketball is fun for anyone to follow, even if you don't care about the sports. We only talk about the silly stuff. It's great. The NBA playoffs are going on right now, so it is peak time to join, so I highly recommend going over checking it out over at horsehoops.com. And speaking of really cool things and awesome people, we have new patrons to welcome to the team. So shout out to Beatrice Patricio, Jeanette Ruskinen, Kyle O'Rourke, Amy Wilkinson, Charlie Botsman, Meg McCourt, Natalie Barnes, Jennifer Brandt, Jordan Johnson, Sean Milligan, Callie Ray Willie, Stephanie, and Emily. Shout out to Stephanie Hofert, who upgraded to producer level status. And shout out to our new producer level patrons, Keegan Curran and Miranda Manning. They join the ranks of Leanne, Vicky, Aaron, Jesse, Natalie, Deborah, Clow, Frank, Marchismo, Tori, Samantha, Juan, Kieran, Rebecca, Abid, Caitlin, Rosemary, Jill, Marie. Lisa, Ariel, Romina, Kamel, Russell, Dustin, Audra, Eleanor, Sydney, Billy, Rossanne, Andre, Nikita, Lala, Chelsea, Taylor, Love, Kesh, Ali, Cassandra, Roxy, Amelia, Sean, Sarah, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Jessica, Arna, Tiago, Jessica, Orchid, Steve, Vivian, Takari, Haley, Marino, Moster, Pinky, Angelina, Ross, Marie, Lee, Alex, Brian, Caitlin, Finn, Mosin, Grace, Sammy, Raul, Ingen, Mari, Brianne, Alexandra, John, Jen, Noel, Tao, Emily, Michael, Robin, Patricia, Will, Liz, Mariah, Brandon, Sarah, Claire, Teal, Sina, Rory, Gloria, Sarah, Patrick, Ali, Cat, Hallie, Veronica, Kevin, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Lucinda, Carlos, Pam, Colleen, Jennifer, for Free Day, Ivor, Naomi, Tyler, Summer, Heather, Vera, Carrie, Andrea, Ella, Anthony, Dead Cat Lady, David, Elisa, Lynn, Emily, Ryan, Cameron, Justin, Christine, Jacob, Toothless, Maya, Mark, Polly, Kimberly, Srujan, Brittany, Nita, Tumnus, Remy, Matt, Sarah, Lauren, Nova, Kyle, Zena, Emily, Colleen, Harlan, Akanksha, Wouter, Shelby, Noelia, Reese, Adriana, Brian, Yukami, Washin, Jenny, Nikki, Kara, Dorcas, Courtney, Kine, Amanda, Sabrina, Lauren, Claire, Alicia, Kafir, Lindy, Martha, Benjamin, Tajinder, Sky, Mark, Sarah, Peter, Yash, Marta, Stephanie, Justine, Aaron, CJ, Eileen, Kate, Violet, Hannah, Kat. Lindsay Elizabeth Fielding and can't I bother who never turn on the wrong burner on the stove and then just sit there with a cold pan for a couple of minutes. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to exclusive merchandise, bonus episodes, director's commentary, exclusive live streams, you can go to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 76 of Potterless, covering Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows chapter 25, guest starring Matt Young of Hello from the Magic Tavern. Welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a grown man reading the Harry Potter series for the very first time. My name is Mike Schubert. I'm that grown man. And today I am joined by a very fitting guest because you may know him as Wizard of the Twelfth Realm of Ephesius, Master of Light and Shadow, Manipulator of Magical Delights, Devourer of Chaos, Champion of the Great Halls of Tarakas. The elves know him as Fiong Yalik. The dwarves know him as Zonin Hoogstangages slash Hoobastank. And in the Northeast, they know him as Gasmoinus Maystar. And there may be more powerful names of which you are not aware. It's Matt Young from Hello from the Magic Tavern, Matt. How's it going? It's going great. Thanks so much for uh, giving Usador's full list of titles. I really appreciate that. You know, I I really wanted to do it justice. It would have been not as fun if I was just like, yeah, he plays a wizard on (laughs) Hello from the Magic Tavern. It's Matt Young. No way. I got to do the full, to to really pay homage and honor to your character on that show. Right. I got to do the full thing. But man, 
How do you do that? I'm out of breath. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> I, I, well. At first, I read it when I first started doing it, which made it a lot easier. Yeah. Now it's sort of like second nature. It's just like kind of burned in the back of my brain, and I'll never forget it. So. <laughs> And yeah, sometimes I pass out after doing it. Yeah. If anyone is uh, confused and doesn't know what Hello from the Magic Tavern is, you want to give them a little background of why I just listed off a million words of magical realms? Absolutely. <laughs> Hello from the Magic Tavern is an improvised comedy podcast. The premise of the show is my friend Arnie plays himself, and he fell through a magical portal behind a Burger King into a world like Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings or mm-hmm. Game of Thrones, kind of all mushed together. And instead of going on a great big adventure and becoming a hero, instead he just decides to host a talk show because he's still getting a Wi-Fi signal. It's very good. (laughs) It's really fun. He gets to host the show and interview all sorts of magical characters. And I'm one of his co-hosts, along with Chunt the Talking Badger. Mm -hmm. We get to be the characters who kind of know the whole world. And Arnie plays the fish out of water. And as people kind of come by the tavern, we get to meet them and learn about this crazy, stupid magic world. So it's a very loving, like, parody of a lot of the things that uh, Harry Potter fans probably love. Yeah, which on brand for Potterless. Yeah. (laughs) We met at PodCon and talked a little bit about Harry Potter. And I knew very, very quickly that I had to have you on the show, not just because you play a wizard on your show, but also the main thing. And I I wanted to start with this story before we continue is you told me about your mom getting very upset at Harry Potter in the fifth book. And I would love to open... (laughs) with telling everyone else that story before we dive into chapters 25 and 26 of The Deathly Hallows. Yeah. You know, I'm a little bit older, so I read Harry Potter as an adult. I was working with a children's theater company here in Chicago, and at one point we had talked, I think after the first or second book came out, we had talked about, like, trying to get the rights to doing it as a stage play. And pretty quickly they were like, "Uh, we're working on a movie deal. We're fine. (laughs) (laughs) We don't need you to do this, you weird, like... 20 something nobodies. <laughs> so I got into the books uh, when I was a little bit older. So I think I started with the second or the third book and kind of caught up. But then as the, like the fourth and fifth books were coming out, I was buying them on Amazon and getting them delivered to me, you know, like day of. Back when Amazon was only books. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> For anyone listening in 2050, Amazon did not control America. <laughs> Yeah, there were no drones. For all the prime citizens living in 2050. (laughs) (laughs) But I would buy a copy for myself and I would buy a copy for my mom for a couple of them. And we would kind of read them together. And uh, so I was like mid, late 20s, something like that. And she got the fifth book and she started reading it. And I kind of checked in with her and she's like, I hate this book. It's the worst one. I don't like this series (laughs) anymore. And I was like, wait, what are you talking about? She's like... That Harry Potter is just like, he's such a little shit. I was like, what? Hey, mom, whoa, hold on. What are you talking about? She's like, well, he's he's snotty. And he talks back to everybody and blah, blah, blah. And he's, she's kind of like just going off on Harry. I go, mom, he's like a 15-year-old boy. That's what 15-year-old boys do. <laughs> and he's not even just a 15-year-old boy. He's a 15-year-old boy going through PTSD. He's a traumatized 15-year-old boy. <laughs> and he is a little snotty. He is a little difficult in that book. But it makes perfect sense for that character at that point. A hundred percent. And once I kind of said that to her out loud, she was like, oh, yeah. But she had just like kind of fallen in love with the whole thing. And like Mm -hmm. the fact that it got a little realer, I think at first (laughs) didn't quite set right. But uh, she came around. Once the end of the fourth book comes around, it does get a lot realer. And and to sympathize with your mom, I went through the same thing where it was the beginning of the fifth book when I was recording these episodes of Potterless. And same thing. I was like, God, this kid, just like, just suck it up, Harry. Don't get mad at everybody for everything. And then one of my guests, thankfully, pointed out, just as you did, yo, he's 15 and he's kind of going through a lot. And then I had to take a step back and realize, oh, right, he's a teenager and I'm grown. And he's surrounded by people who are like, I'm going to maybe tell you what's going on many years from now. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Dumbledore, as we have learned in these chapters, especially, he's not the best at just like telling you stuff. (laughs) Like everything is a riddle and I don't get why everything has to be. (laughs) I mean, I think he thinks he needs to do that. I don't know that he always needed to do that, but I think he like is very protective of Harry and a way to kind of protect him is to leave him out of the loop. But it doesn't always work. No, it does not always work. I think in this book particularly, though, by not telling him the Deathly Hallows was smart because Harry chooses to not go after the Elder Wand, but mainly because it's too late. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's <laughs> like, like fuck that one up. <laughs> if Dumbledore didn't make the Horcruxes take so long, there's a good chance Harry would have been like, I should go for the Elder Wand. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He would have that been the first thing he would have done. But mm-hmm. uh, luckily, he had to figure it out first. Thank goodness. Well, let's get into these two chapters, which are some beefy ones. We're going to begin with chapter 25, which is called Shell Cottage. 
Harry, speaking of this decision, is still agonizing over his choice to not go for the Elder Wand. Hermione thinks that it is the right call, especially since Harry would have had to done some stuff he in no way would have wanted to do. He would have had to go into Dumbledore's tomb and steal something from dead Dumbledore's hand, which doesn't really I mean, seem okay. Uh, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but he wouldn't have had to like crack the vault open <laughs> like Voldemort did and make it such like a... A dramatic, dramatic thing. What a drama queen. Come on. He really is. <laughs> he pulls the wand out and sparks rain down from the roof. Like, that's not even a thing, Voldemort. <laughs> you definitely did some unspoken, nonverbal incantation to make it rain sparks. There, there's a way to go into that tomb and very respectfully take that wand and be like, hey, this is the most powerful wand ever. I'm going to use it to stop evil. <laughs> and we're sorry and I love you. He brought a spray can and wrote, Voldy was here <laughs> on the outside of the tomb. <laughs> he took a selfie with Dumbledore and put it on Instagram. Yeah, but but Harry <laughs> Harry wasn't going to go do that. You're right. No, he definitely wasn't. Ron is less sure because he's Ron. He is thinking that the Elder Wand is so powerful and maybe Dumbledore's signs allowed Harry to earn going after it, which is complete bullshit. <laughs> the Elder Wand, not that great. As Martin Astwick pointed out last episode, for an unbeatable wand, it sure does seem to get beat a lot. So I don't know how good it is. I thought about that too because they say like you have to defeat the owner to to take it away. So if it's undefeatable, you can't really do that. Mm -hmm. But it also seems like maybe there are like a lot of sneaky underhead in ways that people are doing it. Right. Like getting that guy, the original one, getting the dude drunk and slitting his throat in his sleep. Yeah. Kind of thing. Or, you know, Dumbledore just lets himself get killed. You know, he doesn't really fight right. back because he doesn't Very want true. someone else to get it. But uh, that didn't work out because he broke into his grave anyway. Yeah. Ugh. Maybe he shouldn't have put his grave in such a prominent location at Hogwarts. <laughs> right. Right. Right where everyone could find it so easily. Can we talk a second about Ron, too? Yes. And wizards from the wizarding world in general. There's a lot of talk. There's a lot of smack from the Death Eaters about like muggles suck and mudbloods and like terrible things, like awful, awful stuff, right? Like they're mm -hmm. total racist scumbags. Oh, yeah. But then everyone in this chapter is kind of like goblins all suck, right? And it's like, <laughs> hey, hey, man, uh, you're, you're also kind of being an asshole. Yeah. Hermione is the true voice of reason here. Well, and Harry a little bit because he grew up in the muggle world too. And he's mm -hmm. he's less inclined to be like, even though he's trying to get something done, he's kind of willing to like go along with like tricking Grip Hook a little bit. He at least knows it's wrong and has some like, like you said, he's like, he's torn about his decision, you know? He's upset about it. Yeah, Harry and Hermione at least have some sort of hesitation. And Ron is just like, fuck it, they're just goblins. Yeah, there's a lot of very, like, uh, accepted racism <laughs> of, mm -hmm. of other races. And uh, I always remembered that, but it really stood out to me more this time when I was reading it. That, like, oh, yeah, the whole wizarding world kind of, like, needs to, like, get a little more progressive. Yeah, definitely. And Ron is interesting in that he gets very defensive of when people call Hermione mudblood, mm -hmm. um, but not really any sort of other race. Because even with like the Hagrid giant stuff, I feel like he wasn't super defensive of Hagrid. Ron is basically only concerned with like the blood purity racism side of things. But when it goes into other races, he's like, ah, they're not wizards. Well, he's like the white kid who can't see his own privilege, right? Mm -hmm. Like in America, like yeah. he cannot see his own privilege. He also like, seems like the kind of guy who isn't a super mean racist person, but like might laugh at slash tell racist jokes right. or sexist jokes and be like, well, I mean, but women can't drive well, like that kind of thing. <laughs> Like, yeah, but, like, it's kind of true. Like, it seems like that's yeah. <laughs> something Ron would be, be okay with. Yeah, I'm hoping Ron in his later years comes around a little bit. Yeah, maybe in The Cursed Child, Ron is super woke after being married to Hermione for <laughs> however many years. We'll just have to see when I watch that play. <laughs> So Harry is angry at Dumbledore for not being more clear and being more direct with his instructions, saying, quote, that he has left Harry groping in the dark, which everyone hates that I hate the word groping, but it's gross, and I don't like how often it's used in these books. Now, I will say that groping in the dark is kind of a phrase. That is a okay. thing. I feel like... Every time I make fun of this word, because she loves to use the words grope, penetrate, and ejaculate a lot, and I always point it out, and people, especially non-American people are like, come on, what's wrong with grope? And I was like, lots of things. But yeah, I think groping in the dark as a phrase makes more sense. I get more uncomfortable when it says Harry's like groping around in his pocket or like <laughs> groping for Hermione's shoulder or something. Like, that's not a good look. No, and JK, read the room. Like, <laughs> groping is somewhere in that middle ground for me penetrate and, uh -huh. and ejaculate 
in the early 2000s when this book came out. Like, no, uh, you're, you're done. Stop it. Yeah, the, the thing, and this is the, the, I wanted to like bring this up to, to make this clear on an episode is that the only reason that I don't understand why grope is in there, I understand and I can accept why grope is a normal word in the UK, in Britain, whatever. But for the American editions, they change some of the words, like even tiny little things. Like I'm pretty sure they change mum to mom and stuff like that. Why can't they have an American editor just be like, hey, JK, Grope's like not super cool here. Uh, can we use a different word? And she'll be like, yeah. That's my only confusion is that if in the U.S. edition they change little things like philosopher to sorcerer because in America we don't know what a philosopher means, why can't they just change grope to feel? Well, and philosopher <laughs> just sounds super boring. Yeah. I think that was just a pure marketing thing out of the gate. Oh, of 100%. Like, no one's going to read a book about a philosopher's stone. Yeah. So I actually went to the exhibit that they have in New York right now. It's like Harry Potter, a history of magic or something like that. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. And it's like at the – it's not at the history museum. It's like the – National Historical Society Museum. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, it's like when you can't get .com, so you have to get <laughs> .co. Like, that's what it feels like. Oh, man, History Museum was taken. We're the Natural Historical Society Museum. Uh, but it was a really cool exhibit, and they had a bunch of things from the original books. And something that is framed is a letter from someone at Scholastic that is like, look, we think this book is great, but no one in America is going to buy this book called The Philosopher's Stone. <laughs> I understand that The Philosopher's Stone is a thing that exists. Right. That's like a concept, yeah. Yeah, it's like you got to have something in the title that makes people clear that this is about wizards. So we're going to call it the Sorcerer's Stone, which like, yes, it's kind of silly and like, oh, look, America's dumb, but it worked. So oh, it totally that dude, worked. That dude at Scholastic knew what was up. If, if they hadn't done that change, no one would have read that book. They're 100% right. No one would have heard of Harry Potter. And right now we'd all be talking about, I don't know, what have been, Attack of the Clones? I don't know, something like that. <laughs> something from the same time. Yeah, what is, so it was there a, a wizard equivalent? You know how when they make two movies that are the same, like, or the two Fire Festival documentaries or Armageddon <laughs> and, and whatever the other end of the world asteroid movie was? Deep Impact. Do that one, Deep Impact, which title, that's why that one lost. Yeah, Deep right. Deep Impact, that's a porn <laughs> title. Was there one that like came out at the same time as Harry Potter? I know there was like hubbub about there's some old magical book where it's like Larry Fodder or something that JK like might have gotten inspiration from. But was there like anything that came out about the same time that Harry Potter was more popular then? Like the Blu-ray to HD DVDs? <laughs> there were certainly lots of imitators at the time, but I don't know sure. how many would have been actually like contemporary. Yeah. There was actually also like a DC Comics series called The Books of Magic, where there was a uh. lead protagonist who is bespeckled with dark hair who looks exactly like Harry Potter and his name is Tim Hunter. Ah. There was something in the zeitgeist. I mean, that was maybe from the early 90s that that comic started, maybe like 93, 94-ish. Uh-huh. I don't remember exactly now, but... Yeah, and I'd, I'd seen the thing about what the, whatever the, would you say it was, Larry something? It's Larry Potter and his best friend, Lily. Yeah. I pulled up the Wikipedia page. There's a whole Wikipedia page called Legal Disputes Over the Harry Potter Series, and it's eight segments long, wow. which is like not cool. But it says, in 1999, American author Nancy Stouffer alleged copyright trademarks of Rowling by her 1984 works, The Legend of Ra and the Muggles, oh. and the follow-up book, Larry Potter and his best friend, Lily, which like, That's Muggles... Pr- Pretty. And Larry Potter and Lily, like, that's rough. It says the primary basis for Stouffer's case rested in her own purported invention of the word muggles, the name of a race of mutant humanoids in The Legend of Ra and the Muggles, and Larry Potter, the titular character of the series of a book series for children. Larry Potter, like Harry Potter, is a bespeckled boy with dark hair, though he is not a character in The Legend of Ra and the Muggles, so he's not in the first book. Oh. Stouffer also drew a number of other comparisons, such as a castle on a lake, a receiving room, and wooden doors. Okay, wooden doors? You can't... <laughs> what? Nancy Stouffer, get your head out of your ass. I invented the concept of wooden doors and doorknobs. <laughs> I'm the first person to ever write down the word castle. <laughs> Uh, portions of Raw were originally published in booklet form in 1986. A company founded by Stouffer together with a group of friends and family. Ande Publishing filed for bankruptcy in 1987 without selling of any of its booklets in the United States or elsewhere. <laughs> Rowling's defense was that she didn't go to America until 1998. <laughs> Pretty good defense. <laughs> Pretty good defense. I mean, especially if you didn't sell any of it, how would she have even seen it? Right? Yeah, that's crazy. That is ridiculously close. Muggles, Larry Potter, and Lily. That's, that's weird. Bonkers. That is weird. 
I mean, maybe, maybe, ah, who knows? Oh, here it is. <laughs> J.K. Rowling proved by clear and convincing evidence that Stouffer had perpetrated a fraud on the court <gasps> through her submission of fraudulent documents as well as her untruthful testimony, including changes pages year after the fact to retroactively insert the word muggle. Her case was dismissed with prejudice, and she was fined $50,000 for her, quote, pattern of intentional bad faith conduct in relation fees. See, this is why you have to to be the most successful author of your time so you can hire a research team to be like prove to me why these documents were falsified <laughs> like you just have all the money in the world <laughs> you can just be like this is probably a fake thing that someone made up because there's no way it's actually this close to what i made up you know oh well, yeah whether it's fake or not so this girl lost and apparently the original book was like published and didn't have as many similarities so the case got thrown away but like if you're gonna make the claim that jk stole stuff you gotta make it like less obvious like you have to go marvin gay ed sheeran let's get it on whatever the ed sheeran <laughs> song is where it's like it's not 100 percent the same but yeah. you're like i could but see i hear it. it i hear it yeah 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 i hear it i'm listening i'm hear it but yeah if you're going for a fake lawsuit you can't be like, yeah, I wrote a book called Larry Potter. <laughs> I wrote a book about To Chang. <laughs> Larry Potter and the psychiatrists rock. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Well. Ah, uh, lawsuits. Oh, fun stuff. Anyway, Harry Potter. Ron then postulates that Dumbledore might still be alive, but Hermione is not having it. Ron cites the whole mirror thing and the Dobby sending, but Hermione brings up that Harry could have imagined it, but Harry says he doesn't think he did. I'm still very confused about what this eye in the mirror is. I am baffled by what this could be. What I know so far is that it's a fragment of the mirror that was given to him by Sirius to say, like, wherever I am, you'll see me. Right. And he's got a little shard of it, and early in this book, he thought he saw Dumbledore's eye. Right. And then later in the book, when he was calling on for help when they were in Malfoy Manor, he thought he saw Dumbledore's eye again, and then it went away, and then Dobby showed up. So the only thing that I can maybe think about is that Dumbledore somehow has made the connection where, like, the place, quote-unquote, where Sirius is is, like, the afterlife, and now Dumbledore is there. So this mirror is letting him see into it. And because Dumbledore is so powerful, maybe he can't interact with Harry, but he can at least see Harry and see what he's up to and what he's doing. And that maybe is why they were able to get the sword there, whoever made the dough and left the sword, which I think is Snape, but I'm not positive. So maybe Dumbledore has a way to communicate with people because that's the thing is that somehow Dobby got sent in and somehow someone knew exactly where Harry was and dropped the sword in the lake. So if Dumbledore is watching through this little mirror shard, he has to be able to communicate somehow. And I don't know what it is, what it might be, but I'm still confused on how paintings work, and I'm really just banking on them going to Hogwarts at some point and talking to the Dumbledore painting because seems like a good plan, but maybe Dumbledore can talk to Snape through the painting or something, and maybe Dumbledore went to Snape and said, leave the sword here, and then maybe Dumbledore went to Snape and then was like, get Dobby. That's all I can think of. This is unfortunately because I know at least the spoiler that Snape is somehow good and needs some sort of redemption arc. And we're 26 chapters in and he still hasn't done anything fucking good yet. So <laughs> in order to be really good and get the middle name of Harry Potter's kid, he's got to have a big turnaround. So I yeah. have high hopes and maybe Snape is Dumbledore's messenger, basically. Right. That's an interesting theory. I'm not going to say anything else. Yeah, but, uh, thank you. <laughs> this is always a thing that bothered me about paintings is like... I'm sure you've talked about this, but how much of that is... It's got to be like a shade of that person, right? It can't be like yeah, the someone, real... Yeah, someone said something. I think someone sent me an article because it might be on Pottermore. Okay. I'm pretty sure what it is is like when the painting is being made, the alive person has to like talk to the painting to like tell them everything they know and give them their personality. And then they just basically become... It's like if someone like downloaded your brain in a sci-fi movie kind of thing. Yeah. But they only download as much stuff as you tell them. So paintings are just podcasts. Whoa. What? <laughs> this painting brought to you by <laughs> HelloFresh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good theory. I like it a lot. But the thing is, Dumbledore is a headmaster of Hogwarts. So you know that he's going to have a painting. So it feels like they might have prepped that painting a lot. So it seems like he could have talked to it a significant deal before dying because it was like prepared. So hopefully that is what's going down. But I don't even know if they're going to see the Dumbledore painting at all. This is just something that since like the first episode of Book 7 of Potter, I was like, go talk to the painting. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Here's the trick though, right? If he's trying to keep something secret and everyone knows that all of the headmasters have a painting, 
would he avoid telling that painting those secrets, <gasps> assuming uh, that anyone could come listen to that? What if he tells a painting only tell Harry Potter these? Maybe. <laughs> well, we'll just have to see what happens. So Fleur then comes into the room and tells the squad that Griphook has reached his decision. If you recall, in one of the previous chapters, Harry had brought his idea to Griphook about breaking into the little stranger's vault, and Griphook was like, I have to think about it. And now he has reached his decision and wants to speak to them alone. So they go into Griphook's room, and Griphook says that he has agreed to get them access to the vault, but... He has one condition. He wants the sword of Gryffindor in exchange. And Harry's response is great. He's just like, well, you can't have that, which great bargaining on Harry Potter's part. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to give it to him. Ron is like, well, we'll give you something else from the Little Strangers vault. But that's not a good suggestion because Grip Hook's like, I am not a thief. Why would I do that? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So not a good suggestion by Ron Weasley here. No, I mean, he's not usually going to bring the best idea to the table, though, is he? No, he's not. He only makes good suggestions when he says them very offhandedly. So I have a question for you. At this point, what do you know are the things that can destroy Horcruxes? So far, all we've got is Basilisk Fang, Sword of Gryffindor, and whatever Dumbledore was doing to the ring that gave him a super burnt hand. Right. I don't know what that actual spell is. I don't know if it's like the golden sparks that came out of Harry's wand in the beginning of book seven. I don't know if it's something else, but those are the only three things that I know of that can destroy a Horcrux. Oh, past Mike, you're so silly. Hey everyone, editing Mike here on the road in North Carolina at Kelly's sister's graduation using an iPhone. You just keep on forgetting that we know Dumbledore destroyed the ring with the sword of Gryffindor rather than him potentially destroying the ring with some sort of fire spell. It's not even a fire spell. You'll learn that later, but maybe one day you'll remember about the sword. Ugh. And the only thing they have right now is the sword? Yes, the sword is the only thing they have. The Basilisk Fang is not with them. And that is the whole reason of Harry's hesitation. Right. Is that I don't want to give him the sword because we have to destroy the Horcruxes. So because of this, Harry comes up with an idea later about what they can do, which we'll discuss. But first, Harry says that it belongs to them because Godric was a Gryffindor. And Griphook asks, well, whose was it before? And Ron says, no one's. It was made for him. Wasn't it? <laughs> Which I love Rod just like answering a question and then being like, oh, I actually don't know the answer to this question. Uh, my bad. <laughs> well, there's a point in either one of these two chapters or one of the chapters I read to kind of get caught up where someone very offhandedly goes, you know, just like you learned in History of Magic yep, and everyone this, it's else in this is like, book. it's this chapter. Uh, <laughs> it's when Bill, maybe. It's when Bill talks to Harry. It's so funny. So good. Oh, it's so fucking good. But Griphook says no, that it belonged to Ragnarok the First, which definitely sounds like something that could be in Usador's intro. <laughs> <laughs> and it says it was taken from him by Godric Gryffindor. One thing I really, really respect about J.K. Rowling's writing is the way that she... She has a very clear history worked out. Mm -hmm. This is a thing I like in fantasy and sci-fi in general when it's like, but is that true? And one of the things we played with early on in Hello from the Magic Tavern, the idea that we're stuck in one place and we're just getting news brought to us. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we're improvising and just doing comedy means like if when things contradict, it's probably because we're not always getting good information. Mm -hmm. So I love that in a fantasy thing when it's like, oh, well, you thought you knew this, but actually is that really right and 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 the way the books got more sophisticated over time really allowed that to happen where you could question things that you had taken as absolute verbatim truth kind of like you do when you're a kid so right. it's, it's the more that parallel of like going from a child to being like a juvenile to, to being an adult yeah you have to start questioning things and be like look things on the surface might seem this way and the same thing with all the kind of like racism stuff like within the <laughs> wizarding world is like, oh, you know, it's easy just to assume like goblins are creatures and we don't even think about them. But then like this chapter makes you think about like they have a point of view, too. And that point of view is is valid. Yeah. Which is cool. That's really cool. No, it, it definitely is. And it's something that I'm glad you bring this up because I will get upset in these episodes of Potterless where something changes. Mm. And I'll be like, well, that's not something we knew before. This isn't something that we knew about before. But you're right. It's You can't always trust that the information that we're given as the reader is accurate. Right. Because you learn new wrinkles from new characters. And the other thing to keep in mind, it's something that definitely is parallels in, at least in America. The thing is we know so much of the Wizarding World from A History of Magic, which was written by Bathilda Bagshot, who we now learn like might not be the best person. Yeah. And 
might be a little sketchy. So it could be the situation where like her textbook is like not super accurate, kind of like in America. It's like, yeah, the Vietnam War was fine. We weren't that mean. Yeah, we didn't fight the Civil War over slavery. It was over like states' rights. Yeah. It's like, no, we fought the Civil War over slavery. And we rewrote textbooks to make it like more palatable to people from southern states mm-hmm. so they didn't have to face the fact that this terrible thing existed in our country for hundreds of years. Yeah. Okay, editing Mike here with a less silly and more serious note to make sure that we're all on the same page here. What Matt is referring to is that the South left the Union because of hostility against slavery. You can double check this by looking at the secession documents from each of the states in the Union. There are some wild things in there, such as South Carolina saying its justification for secession is due to, quote, an increasing hostility on the part of non-slaveholding states to the institution of slavery, and then Mrs. Mississippi with the absolutely bonker statement that our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. So the South did leave because of slavery, but it's not set in stone that the Union fought the Civil War because of slavery. There's a lot of claims that they really just fought the Civil War to get the South back and slavery was kind of like a second prize kind of good thing that went along with it. That is up for dispute. What is not up for dispute and what Matt is trying to talk about here is that the South left because of slavery and textbooks try to make it say that it's about states' rights and it really wasn't. I did a lot of research to make sure that this was right. You can check it out. There's lots of articles. I promise if you want to have a nice, thorough discussion about this, feel free to email potterlesspodcast at gmail.com. Twitter's probably not the best place to do this. And it's that same idea of like, everyone has an agenda, everyone has a point of view and there's more to than just listening to somebody and understanding them. It's like understanding where they come from and understanding what their point of view is, which is a very sophisticated idea to get across in a series of kids' books about wizards. Yeah, but she does a good job. I'm super she bummed that job. she didn't go through and make a history of magic. She was like going to make that textbook and then Scholastic dropped it or she stopped doing it. It was like in production and then it got cut short. Oh. Yeah, that would have been super oh, that cool. That would have been really right? interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I would maybe one day she'll go back when she wants more money and she <laughs> makes it. But hopefully we can still get it. So Harry says they need a few minutes to think it over. So they leave and the squad talks about it. Harry asks Hermione if it was true about the sword being stolen, and Hermione says she doesn't know because wizarding history skates over what they've done to other magical races. And I wrote in my notes, wow, what a parallel. (laughs) Ron then says, like, some racist stuff about goblins, as you mentioned, where he's like, oh, it's just goblins, whatever. Not great. Not a great look for Ron. Because he then goes on to say, like, what if we just, like, steal it? What if we just say we're going to give it to him and then we don't? Like, he just keeps suggesting the worst possible ideas. I have to come back to Ron's defense here, though, okay. a little bit. Uh-huh. In the fact that he is a 17-year-old boy uh-huh. who's grown up in a world where everyone around him believes these things. Mm-hmm. And for the first time in his life, he is being confronted with these things. I have great hope that Ron, especially like you said, with Hermione, can move past this. And I think it's like that idea of like, oh, when you spend more time with people who are different than you, you have to learn to be empathetic and like Ron is a product of where he came from. (laughs) And that doesn't mean he's not responsible for his behavior or what he says, but it also means like, I think, I think there's hope for Ron. I just want to say, I think there's hope for Ron. Oh, totally. And, and the thing is like in normal society, like a normal person, you got to think it doesn't really happen until your senior year of high school where you start to develop your own thoughts. And that's why like anytime you see a video of like a tiny kid saying something racist or like wearing Trump gear or whatever, that's their parents. Right. That is oh, not yeah. them. They have no control over that. They're just being told something and they're parroting it and they may feel like they believe it, but they don't haven't really processed it or had the time to like challenge it. I mean, unfortunately some people get into a mode where they never get to that point and never do kind of like question things, Mm -hmm. but you know, hopefully, hopefully more people can. Yeah. I think you're right though. I feel like at least for me, cause Ron's like 17 or maybe 18. I don't know. Cause his birthday's whatever. He's a junior senior in high school. Right. That's about the time when I was really developing my own thoughts and not just like going on with whatever my parents thought, which like, thankfully my parents are like really nice people. Uh, shout out to Barb and Joel. They're great. But <laughs> like uh, 17 and 18, I remember that was for me, that's like when Obama was going for his first election. And I remember that was like yeah. the first time I really like looked into politics and just to like see what was going on rather than just like think about what my parents are doing. I was able to like see stuff and be like, oh, I can I can build my own thoughts. Right. I had a similar experience, although slightly less uh uh 
flattering. <laughs> <laughs> My freshman year of college would have been the 92 election, mm-hmm. which was Clinton versus George H.W. Bush. Ooh. So Bush had one term and then Clinton came in. Mm-hmm. And I was a little too young to vote because I started college when I was 17, not 18. Oh, wow. And everyone at my college was so excited about Bill Clinton, in retrospect, maybe whatever. <laughs> uh, I mean, I get it over but he was Bush, cool. but like, but he was cool and he like played the saxophone. You know, right. And people were so excited about it. And I wasn't that I loved George Bush or that I hated Bill Clinton. I was just like, why would you even care about either one of these people? Mm -hmm. And I try to remember to remember that when I hear about people saying they don't care about or they think these things don't apply to them, like in Washington of like, well, it just doesn't make any difference in my life because I thought that at one point. Yeah, I was like, oh, this is this has nothing to do with me. And it was the first time I ever thought like, oh, I guess I should next time when I am able to vote, I need to like look into this and figure it out. But it was like it was a very like clear like moment that I remember of being like, oh, yeah, I can, I can think about this and I can choose to know, know more about it. And and it does make a difference who mm-hmm. is in charge. It was like you were saying there are those I think there are the little epiphanies, little moments uh-huh. that I can very distinctly remember where I'm like. Oh, yeah, that's a thing I should think about. <laughs> yeah, and definitely, like like you're saying, and I think Ron's in this similar kind of boat. And, and I was in the same thing, too, where, like, my parents are just, like, not super into politics. Right. And they don't even have, like, a dedicated side. They just, like, go with whatever is best. But, like, that was the thing is, like, I was like, why is everyone making such a big deal about this Obama guy? Like, I thought we don't care about politics. We're too young to care about it. And then that was the thing where I was like, oh, maybe I should start. So Ron could be in the same thing, whereas, like, the Weasleys aren't racist, but they definitely are pure blood wizards, and all the people around him are wizards. So it could just be the thing where Ron is just like, oh, yeah, this is just like how people think about goblins and stuff. They have huge, huge blind spots because they don't have to not have those blind spots. Yeah. You know, they they can just operate the way they are. Yeah. So I think if anything, it's just like Ron approaching these for the first time. So, yeah, I have high hopes for Cursed Child Ron, <laughs> especially since he's going to be with Hermione. <laughs> All right, past Mike, let me break this thing down for just a few seconds. I And, and I'm not going to have you break this thing down for nothing because it's time for Wingardium at Ridosa. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Shaker and Spoon. Let's say hypothetically that you just won a big lawsuit case against someone that was trying to claim that the very popular children's book series that you wrote was actually stolen from a book series that they wrote that didn't even get published back in like the late 80s. But their claims are completely unsubstantiated and you won the case and now you want to celebrate. Well, you don't want to go out to a bar because you just want to be with your close group of friends and slash or lawyers and you don't want to deal with expensive prices and trying to find bartenders and loud bars and looking for parking and all that other stuff. You just want to have a little nice get together at your place with fancy cocktails at an affordable price. That's where Shaker and Spoon can help. Shaker and Spoon is a delivery box service that sends you wonderful ingredients to make fancy cocktails. And they also teach you how to make them. All you need to do is provide the bottle of liquor and they give you all sorts of mix-ins, whether it's syrups, juices, soda, fresh citrus, a whole nutmeg, literally the nut. They will provide you with whatever you need to make three different recipes and four servings of each. Recently, me and my buddies got a box. My buddy Steven, who's listening. Hello, Steven. How's it going? Steven got a box from Shaker and Spoon that was centered around tequila because me, Steven, and our buddy Chet all enjoy tequila. We made some tacos because we all went to college in Texas and we miss Tex-Mex being readily available to us. So we had a whole taco and tequila night and it was fantastic. The drinks were delicious. One was really light and citrusy. One was nice and savory and one was spicy. It was so much fun. It was a great time. And Steven got a great deal on it because he went to shakerandspoon.com slash potterless and got $20 off his first box, which was great. It's basically 50% off, which is huge. So if you want to go and learn how to make new fancy drinks and get educated in the art of fancy drink making and celebrate your legal victory and not have to deal with a gross bar, head on over to shakerandspoon.com slash potterless and save that money and get drunk today. Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by the app Calm. Let's say hypothetically that you just buried someone that was very important to you and you also are very stressed because you have a large task at hand and you're only a teenager and you really need to be in the best mental space to go forward and complete this task because the entire wizarding world is depending on you well calm sounds like an app you need to download to your phone pronto 
Calm is the number one app for sleep, meditation, and relaxation. They have hours upon hours of guided meditations that help you go through an entire relaxing meditative process, which is great for someone like me that has no idea how to meditate. It's very nice when people give you exact instructions on what you need to do, telling you how to breathe in a very soothing way with rain droplet noises in the background. It was a wonderful experience using the guided meditation. They also have sleep stories, which are basically bedtime stories for adults that are nice and relaxing. So if you struggle to go to bed at night because that's when your mind starts to race and be really awake and think about everything, usually the bad things, these sleep stories can help. Some are read by Harry Potter audiobook narrator Stephen Fry. What's not to love? And as a Potterless listener, you can get a discount on a Calm Premium subscription. You can get 25% off that Calm Premium subscription if you go to calm.com slash Potterless. That's C-A-L-M dot com slash Potterless. You'll get 25% off a Calm Premium subscription with which gives you access to all of their meditations, all of the sleep stories, and those meditations can be tailored to whatever you're looking for. If you're trying to focus, if you're trying to relax, if you're trying to reduce stress or anxiety, they have a lot of different things that can be tailored to whatever you need. So it's nice and flexible and it's there for you. So go to calm.com slash Potterless, download the app, get that discount on the Calm Premium subscription and overcome your grief and get ready for the task at hand today. So Ron does have a good line where uh, I want to get I want to get the exact quote. Oh, is this the part where Ron says, Harry, Harry, you're a wizard? <laughs> no, I, oh, I forgot that part. Wouldn't that be great if he just said that for no reason in the middle of the seventh book? <laughs> Everybody just looked at him like, what is going on right now? Why is he saying that? So Hermione gets mad at him for trying to double cross him. And then uh, Hermione says, we need to offer him something else, something just as valuable. And then Ron says, quote, brilliant. I'll go and get one of our other ancient goblin made swords if you can gift wrap it. (laughs) (laughs) Which I was like mad at Ron. And then I was like, all right, that was pretty good. (laughs) It's a pretty good burn. It's a pretty good burn. It's a good joke. (laughs) Harry then brings up that he also doubts that goblin history is 100% correct, which another valid point. And Hermione asks if that makes a difference. And Harry says, quote, it changes how I feel about it. Mm. So Harry ultimately comes to the conclusion that they're going to tell the half truth and just say, we'll give you the sword after you let us into the vault, but not clarify when. Yeah. So then he says, well, yeah, after like (laughs) just he's trying to be like a genie and, and pull one of those shenanigans where it's like, well, I never clarify. He's trying to do some monkey paw shit. Yeah, 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 yeah some yeah, monkey paw shit. Tricky. <laughs> Hermione protests, but Harry holds firm. His whole reasoning is that we have to destroy the Horcruxes. We need the sword to do it. We will give it to him definitely 100%. We just got to destroy all the horcruxes. So they go back, they present the offer to Griphook, and he accepts. They then start to plan with Griphook, and it takes a while because a lot of things involving knowing where to go in the vault, what they got to do, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this plan should not have worked. <laughs> yeah, it, it did not go as planned, uh, but and spoiler it, and it alert. Doesn't, it doesn't. So, yeah, it yeah, kind of works, but they get the next chapter. They forever have burn marks all over their body from it. Yeah. <laughs> so the Lestrange vault is super old and really big and heavily protected. Griphook's only been there once. The squad only has enough polyjuice potion to make one, to do like one or two more people. Things are not adding up to be super great. As they're doing the plan, they realize that Griphook is bloodthirsty because he gets excited about every single time they mention that wizards might get hurt in the process, which as it goes on, you just don't trust Griphook. No, not at all. Unfortunately, the squad needs him. So he then develops into a very needy house guest for Bill, wanting food in his room and wanting different type of food, one of which was like he wanted raw meat, which at first I was like, ew, gross. But then I was like, maybe Grip Hook's just really fancy and wants steak tartare. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny that they go out of their way or she goes out of her way to explain in this chapter and the last chapter a little bit. They kind of are like being sympathetic to goblins, but then they like paint this terrible picture of him. Mm-hmm. And a terrible picture of Ollivander of like, oh, they're kind of obsessed with their... (sighs) There's this idea that like magical people get obsessed with certain parts of magic and it kind of undoes them. Mm, Yeah. You know, Voldemort being like the worst version of that, he doesn't want to die. So he goes to all these great lengths to like have these horcruxes and stay alive no matter what. Ollivander's obsessed with wands and like... So he... This dude is so creepy. I don't like Ollivander. He's so sketchy. Yeah. And then like Griphook is like just wants to hurt people and like is just kind of, I guess... 
I don't know if greedy is the right word, but they're like, is obsessed with material things. Yeah, he's just very hellbent on the goblin idea that creators of items are the rightful owners. And he thinks that wizards have violated this rule far too often. And thus, wizards need to pay for this. And his thought of that is pain. Right. And it's interesting that after kind of making these characters more relatable and more sympathetic that now you start painting this ugly picture. So you kind of get back. It's it's kind of a trick of J.K. Rowling's <laughs> to be like, the wizards are good. They're not bad. You know, there's a little bit of like sleight of hand of like, forget that like I made you feel sorry for this guy for a minute. Like he kind of sucks. <laughs> uh, or the underlying thesis statement is that everybody sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too probably is I, more accurate. This, it's like we have these characters that we love and then they do shitty things like Lupin does some shitty things and Ron does shitty things it, and Sirius does shitty things. Like it's, <laughs> I just feel like every character that we like, J.K. Rowling has to find a way to be like, well, they also suck. Yeah, but I think that's great writing because it's like no that perfect. makes them human, yeah. you know? Pobody's nerfect. What's that? Oh, I said Pobody's nerfect. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a good point. That was one of the things that, like, to go on a tangent here a little bit, uh, when there was all the backlash about Last Jedi. That was so stupid. Ugh. I love, love The Last Jedi. And I grew up on Star Wars. Oh, I'm of that generation good. that, like, grew up on Star Wars and was there when it was first happening. And love, love, love it. And I love it so much because Luke is a very flawed character because back in the original trilogy... Luke is a very flawed character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) He has a journey of like, I'm adventurous. I'm going to go do anything and I'll, I I don't care. I'm not going to think ahead too far. I'm just going to go do stuff. And everybody around him is like, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. And then 30 years later, it kind of worked out, but it's now he's on the other side of it. He's like, I have to be careful. I have to be careful. I learned my lesson. And he like went too far the other direction. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a cool, interesting character arc. And that's what I love about like, you know, uh, Lupin or or, uh, Sirius being these great heroes of the past that also have real issues Mm -hmm. and they have to overcome those things to still try to do the right thing. And, Sometimes they're better at it than others, and that that feels very real to me. Yeah, I definitely I was more upset with Lupin until later on in the chapters that we're discussing when he comes in mm-hmm. and is so stoked about being a father. Yeah, that like undid all of my because I definitely like you can listen to the episode of Potter, so I just like trash Lupin, and I was like, fuck it, I thought Lupin was good, <laughs> blah, blah blah. But you're right, like nobody's perfect, and people overcome it. And I'm very glad that in these chapters we got to see him overcome it, where like he comes in and it's like it's an emergency, and we're like, oh shit, what's up? And he's like, oh, I had a Boy. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty that good. Is, it is good to see him overcome and be like, okay. Because then it's more like the Luke thing where in Last Jedi, I won't give spoilers in case anyone hasn't seen it, but like Luke has a thing where he makes a, a rash bad decision or comes close to making a bad decision yeah. just because of a rash thought, but then ultimately doesn't go through with it. Yeah. But then there's still repercussions. And Lupin is the same thing. He has a bad rash decision of being scared about bringing a child into the world, especially given the way the world is and his situation as a werewolf, etc. And like all the crap that's going to come along with it. Understandable? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Pretty understandable. (laughs) But then he overcomes it and is just happy and and does the best he can. So I'm glad he had that little redemption. I now feel better about the Holubin thing because you're right. It makes him like more complex and better and not just like he was great and now he's shitty, which is definitely what I said to him, which I apologize retroactively. That was not nice of me to be (laughs) like, oh, Lupin's canceled. (laughs) No, but I get it. I mean, I get it in the moment where you're like, this character who I love does something crappy and you're like that's really disappointing you know and that's mm-hmm. that should be the experience you're having while you're reading the book so that totally makes sense yeah uh i don't want to jump ahead because i know i keep doing it <laughs> but uh, when we get to it let's let's talk about ted lupin a oh bit. yeah oh for sure we definitely will all right speaking of the raw meat that grip hook likes they mentioned that bill also has a taste for raw meat ever since getting bit by grayback and i want to know what other wolf slash dog like tendencies Bill Weasley has because he's been bit by Greyback. Like, does he chase the mailman? Does he pee with one leg up? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. He poops in the yard. (laughs) Does he scratch his legs in the grass after pooping and stuff? (laughs) Does he really like fetch? Like, I want to know what other tiny dog like quirks he has. (laughs) I kind of imagine that he like sits by the window when there's a full moon and he kind of is just like. He kind of wants to scream or like howl, but he's like trying to not do it so he doesn't upset his wife. When he's alone by a window and Fleur is asleep, he just like very quietly goes like, Ow. Ooh, ooh. 
<laughs> and then Fleur wakes up and is like, oh, qu'est-ce que c'est? <laughs> he's like, nothing, honey, go to bed. Not, nothing, nothing. I was just uh, looking at pornography. <laughs> oh, um, there's a, there's an owl outside. Um, <laughs> uh, go, to, go to bed, honey. I'll be right in. <laughs> So Harry feels bad about putting Bill through all of this and just putting a strain on the Weasleys as well because they can't go to work since they're in hiding. Mm -hmm. So he apologizes to Fleur at one point when they're alone in the kitchen. And she brings up, oh, but you saved my sister that one time in the fourth book. And narrator Harry is like, Harry thought about how the time her sister wasn't really in danger, but he didn't say anything, which what an expert move by Harry to be like, I'm not going to ruin my uh, negotiation tactic here. Right, right. Yeah, because she had a protection spell on her was that the deal it was the whole underwater thing Fleur's right little sister was the person that got taken away and then after the fact right you learn that they probably weren't actually going to die but harry went through and saved her sister when Fleur couldn't when she got attacked by grindylos or whatever which caused him to lose like he yeah. saved people which caused, caused him, him to lose, lose. but he got yeah. bonus points for being nice what a nice guy what a guy that harry potter so she then talks about rearranging the house after Ollivander leaves and Harry talks about leaving and she is shocked and basically goes into full Molly Weasley mode where she's like, <laughs> you cannot leave. What is it? But then uh, Luna and Dean enter at the perfect time before she can continue this rant. And Luna, of course, is talking about Crumplehorn and Snorkaxe. <laughs> <laughs> and she refuses to believe Hermione when Hermione's like, the horn was in a rumpet horn, Luna. How many times do I have to fucking tell you? And I love that Luna does not drop it. She sticks to it and sticks to her bit. I love it. I would absolutely be as annoyed as Hermione is by <laughs> Luna in, in real life. But I love Luna Lovegood as a character. She is the best. Very good. Very, very solid. Very good. Yeah. So Ollivander does a whole big dramatic leaving. And Fleur gives Ollivander the tiara that she borrowed from Aunt Muriel for the wedding to give back to Muriel. Is the tiara important? The tiara is important in that Molly Weasley uses it as a way to signify that she accepts Fleur into the family. It's this yeah. big moment at the end of the sixth book when Bill's in the hospital. And then it is used a little bit here to make them hesitant about Grip Hook. And then also something that we end up learning about Muriel. Yeah. And that hesitation kind of triggers the conversation between Bill and Harry, I guess. Exactly. So yeah, when okay. Grip Hook sees the tiara, he kind of freaks out a bit because it's brought up that the tiara is made of moonstones and diamonds. And it was paid for by wizards. So... At dinner, Bill says Ollivander is safe and that Muriel is being driven mad by Fred and George's new owl business, which is <laughs> great. I love that they are the ultimate entrepreneurs, but not the douchey entrepreneurs. Right. That like put entrepreneurs, their job title on LinkedIn uh, and use words like innovate and optimize. But they're like the good <laughs> ones that just like make cool shit. <laughs> no, yeah, they're great. If they were like humans right now, they'd like open a brewery. Oh, yeah. And they'd have like, you know, the most like bespoke, you know, furniture and, and stuff in that store. And then they'd import like local meats. They'd be great. Oh, they would be so good. Dang, I need this now. Uh, <laughs> but Bill also mentions that Muriel is glad the tiara is back because she thought they stole it. So glad Auntie Muriel is still on her bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> I, for a second, I got distracted by the tiara when I was reading. So I was like, what, what does the tiara do? Is the tiara important? What is the tiara? What is the tiara? And then, like, I kind of realized what we said of, like, oh, it's just to trigger these conversations. Yeah, and it does trigger the next conversation as well, yeah. which is Luna Lovegood, which yes. she brings up the crown that her dad made, and Ron smirks because this is the quirky, weird-looking headdress that they saw Xenophilius working on when they were in his house mm -hmm. because it's supposed to belong to Rowena Ravenclaw. And what's bonkers to me is that no one in the squad speaks up because they know that they're looking for stuff from the founders of Hogwarts. And Ravenclaw is one of the founders of Hogwarts. Right. So there is a chance that this thing is a horcrux. And they're just like, lol, remember that shitty thing we saw Xenophilus making? Ugh, what an idiot. And that's it. They like, don't talk about it. I thought they were going to bring it up. I wrote big in my notes. Hell yeah, it's a horcrux. I knew it. Like, there was a huge red flag when they were talking about this headdress. They went in way too much detail. I was like, this has to be important. This has to be a horcrux. I don't know if there's a real one or whatever. Like, there, there's got to be something here. And they just gloss over it here. I, ugh. Here's the thought that I had. If it is the lost diadem of Rowena Ravenclaw. Rowena? Yeah. I think Rowena. Unless it's like Dirk Nowitzki where it's spelled with a W and you say with a V and she's like Rowena right. Ravenclaw. Right, right, right. Is it another thing that could destroy a horse? Oh. Like the sword. Ooh. That was my thought initially. I was like, oh, are they being handed a weapon that they just gave away? Ooh. 
this is a good theory. Yeah, because it appears as if they're going to lose the sword and they need something to do it. But I, 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 how are they? Does it shoot a laser beam? <laughs> like, what does it do? I just smash it, I guess. You I, know, yeah, I don't know. It's a really powerful rock and you just have to like, buh, like you're opening a coconut. <laughs> it's the only thing I could think of, man. Oh, I like, like it. I like it. They're spending a lot of time on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason that they don't talk about it is because there's a bang at the front door and it's Lupin. I was initially suspicious. I think Lupin also pulled this shit when he came and visited them in Grimald Place where he doesn't just be like, hey, it's Lupin. He like gives this long, big, dramatic introduction to who he is, which is like a he doth protest too much thing, where he's like, I am Remus Lupin. I am a werewolf. I taught Harry at school that one time. My middle name is this. I am 6'3 and have a must." Like, he gives <laughs> way too much information. I was like, this seems like a dude pretending to be Lupin. I always assumed that was some security protocol they had set up or had something to do with the secret keepers. Yeah. But I don't know the actual answer to that. I, I suspect it's a thing that they have to do to be yeah. able to get in or something. He brings up the secret keeper thing, so that's what I think it is. But I just wish everybody had cute little code words like Arthur and Molly did where they ask, what is the pet name that I call you? Yeah. Like, that's that would the be best. So I think it should all be silly little questions that people wouldn't know the answer to. Yeah, that's smart. You're smart. You're right. <laughs> but I think you're right. I think this is just what has to be done to allow the secret keeper charm to let him in or whatever. Yeah. He says he was supposed to come in case of an emergency, and he looks kind of rough when he comes in, but then he just says, it's a boy! We've named him Ted after Dora's father! Which, cool, Lupin, scared me a little bit, but actually, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's really happy. I still think it was too dramatic, and maybe just send a Patronus, but he comes and he asks Harry to be the godfather, which is really sweet, and Harry accepts. Then Bill grabs a bunch of wine for them to all toast. Lupin hints that the child might be a metamorph magus like Tonks because he says that the baby's hair color keeps changing every time he sees it, which is super sweet. Yeah, I love that. Grip is basically unfazed and then Lupin leaves. So what do you want to say about Ted Lupin? This is the next series, right? Mm. Like when she really wants money, she's not going to write the history of magic. You write the story of like Ted Lupin. That would be good. That would be good because it's someone that we really don't know a lot about so she can create new stuff. And this was always my thought. I'm not particularly fond of the Fantastic Beasts thing because ultimately the main character is the dude that wrote that textbook. Yeah. Uh, which seems less exciting. I want more than anything the Minerva McGonagall backstory. Ooh. That seems like a no-brainer to me. Hell but yeah. if you don't want to do something where you go back and you're going forward and talking about people we don't know, Ted Lupin seems like a great one. That could be super fun. I don't want to spoil too much, but this is a tiny, tiny spoiler for Cursed Child. Okay, fine. Ted Lupin is not in that story and apparently there was some backlash Oh, that. that sucks. Because he's just not in it. Yeah. But I think that is intentional. Oh. I think he got set aside. Oh, so that she can revisit it. Yeah, because this dude, we don't know exactly what boils down in the baby, but he is potentially a werewolf metamorph magus. Like, what if he can turn into any animal? Yeah. Right? Like, what if those things combined? That's so interesting. Fuck, I want the Ted Lupin story right now. Fine, I'll start writing it. <laughs> yeah. Next audio drama. <laughs> Ted Lupin, and we'll get sued immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so Bill congratulates Harry for being the godfather while walking into the kitchen and then shuts the door behind them so they can talk about something else, which is an absolute baller move. Yeah. Like I know Bill Weasley was supposed to be cool the whole time and I had no sort of indication that he was cool. This solidifies that Bill Weasley is really cool because I just imagine he's carrying dirty dishes and it's like, oh, Harry, that's so great. Closes the door and like grabs Harry by the face and is like, all right, listen. <laughs> I love this. And I love this scene because the way it's written, I don't know if Bill knows the plan, but it's definitely possible that Bill knows the plan somehow. I'm pretty sure Bill knows the plan. He worked at Gringotts. Yeah. I think he knows the plan. He may not have all the details, but he knows something's up and he's like, look, I'm not going to mess your thing up. I'm not going to out you, but I am going to tell you what is what, and you better be doing this right, or you're yeah. going to you're gonna blow it. <laughs> this scene is the Bill Weasley redemption arc for me in that I thought he was just very boring and not actually cool for being lauded as being cool. Right. But this scene is great. You're right. He handles this perfectly well. I'm not going to mess up your stuff. I know you're not going to tell me the thing, so I'm not even going to bother. But let me just warn you, because I worked at Gringotts and I know Goblin. So, yeah, I don't think he knows the full plan, but I'm pretty sure he 
he knows they're going to use the goblin to break into some sort of vault at Grand Gods. I don't think that he knows that it is the Lestranges. I also don't think he knows about Horcruxes at all, but he knows they're going to use Grip Hook to do something. And he even predicts, like, don't wager with him, even though they've already wagered with him. Right. Well, here's so, the other thing about yeah. this scene. is like, at this point, why doesn't Harry call it all off? Mm. Or come up with some sort of alternate plan and be like, hey, I have new information I guess maybe they're just too committed and they have to get in there and they don't see another way. Yeah, because at this point, they're planning on leaving the next morning. Right. So I think it's just everything is just too far along. Also, Harry Potter being Harry Potter, he is very much the person to come up with the first plan and be like, this is the idea. Yeah. Like, when has he ever gone back to the drawing board ever? No, I, I get that. <laughs> but it's very good advice, which he mostly ignores. <laughs> that The title of Harry Potter, that the, the right. alt, like his autobiography. Harry Potter and the advice he received that was totally good, but he ignored. <laughs> oh, man. So Bill gives him this whole spiel. Bill expresses his concern, saying that if he made some sort of deal involving treasure, you have to be careful because goblins are just a different breed and they treat ownership differently. And this is where he says to Harry, but you'll know all that from a history of magic. Yeah. <laughs> Which, I don't know if you read the books, Bill, but Harry's not reading that shit ever. <laughs> it's such a good, like, non-insult insult. Like, he doesn't mean it as an insult in any way. No. But in that moment, Harry is, like, horribly embarrassed that he just, like, <laughs> had so many opportunities to learn things that could have helped him that he just did not take. <laughs> Bill warns that goblins don't trust wizards with gold and treasure because in their mind, ownership belongs to the maker. And in wizards' minds, ownership belongs to whoever purchased it. Cites the whole tiara thing that Grip Hook was going down with because, you know, it was purchased by wizards but made by goblins. Made him mad. It's really interesting that goblins think that you're just always renting something. Yeah. From them. Like they're a giant rent-a-center or something. It's super strange. You can yeah. buy this couch and you can keep it for your whole life, but then we want it back. <laughs> are, you, are you sure? I farted on that thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yes, you're right. Bill explains that goblins think that purchasing is just rent renting, and he says that reneging on a promise to a goblin is more dangerous than breaking into Gringotts. And this is coming from Bill Weasley, dude that worked at Gringotts, and spoiler alert, knows there's a big-ass dragon in Gringotts. Right, like, right. Like, whoa, whoa. I also imagine that line is said as, and it's even more dangerous, Harry, than breaking in <laughs> to Gringotts. <laughs> And then he stares at him for a while. And furrows his eyebrow. Yeah, exactly. It's like that gif, I don't know, it's on Twitter a lot where I don't know what the context is, but it's a guy with funky hair staring down Puff Daddy slash Diddy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And it just goes back and forth and the guy's eyebrows just keep getting higher and higher. It's that <laughs> gif. Yeah, it's that. It's that moment <laughs> for sure. So Harry then leaves this conversation thinking that he might be as reckless of a godfather as Sirius Black was to him. And that's the end of chapter 25. And that's the end of this episode of Potterless. Matt, we will be discussing chapter 26 in the next episode. Awesome. But how do you feel about this chapter? Uh, I love how it ends. I love that Harry has that realization about Sirius because it feels of like a very adult thing to think. Right. And I do like the moments where Harry does... Like, I, we kind of given him a hard time for not taking this advice, but mm -hmm. I love that he is like, I'm not perfect, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's coming to grips with it. Because there's so much pressure on him to be so amazing and so great. The greatest wizard, the greatest wizard, since he was like 11. Mm -hmm. But he knows. He knows he's just some dude, and it's... <laughs> that it, it just all happened to fall into his lap. You know, yeah. it's like, it's nothing about him being special in any particular way other than that, like circumstances force you to be special and it, it's kind of a great story because it it helps make him the every man that everyone can relate to definitely so i feel good about it i mean i know that we're going to green gots next mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure that plan's going to go off without a hook you know <laughs> it's i'm pretty be sure totally fine it's going to be totally fine everything's going to go exactly as they planned and they're going <laughs> to sneak right out of there no one's going to know any different <laughs> Yeah. Uh, going back to what you said, I do like that Harry is coming to grips with his humanity and his imperfections. It's something that he touches on briefly throughout the books, but I think is becoming more and more of a theme in the seventh is that he realizes he's not perfect and that he's not necessarily this amazing wizard. He's this guy who happens to be at the right place at the right time and just acts on instincts and things work out well for him every now and then. Yeah. And I'm glad that he also recognizes it. I think it makes him a more interesting character, especially because he's like, look, I'm just a dude. It even is something that if I'm 
ever talking to someone about the podcast and they're like, oh my goodness, you are such a genius for thinking of this idea and <laughs> coming up with this podcast series. Like, it is so brilliant. I'm like, yo, I'm just a dude that didn't read books. Right. And then <laughs> I thought about reading them on a podcast and then I met a cute girl that said she liked Harry Potter. So I was like, I'll start the podcast so I have an excuse to talk to her more. And then someone at Spotify put it on the featured thing for a month and now I'm here. I'm not a genius. I'm just very fortunate. <laughs> like, I'm just a dude. People are like, oh, you're so smart. Be like, no, I'm fucking not. But it is a very, like, uh, you know, if you believe in, the, like, the house stuff, it's a very Gryffindor trait to be like, <laughs> I'm going to go do this thing and see what happens. You know, mm -hmm, like, I, right. I'm not going to, like, plan it all out and figure it out. You started a podcast because, like, you could. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people talk about starting things and then don't start them. It's that drive to get things done and to get them started and then write it wherever it goes that it makes you makes you a classic Gryffindor. <laughs> I mean, it just do stuff like anything. Just like do it and see what happens, because you can even see that with Magic Tavern, which is like a huge and very successful podcast now. Oh, I never, ever <laughs> expected that to go more than six episodes <laughs> I mean, ever. Yeah, yeah. And like you like I've been listening to it. I think I'm on like episode like 15 now. So I got past the like fun twist at chapter or at, at episode 10. But like there's even stuff where you set up the email where where people can write in and Artie will be like, <laughs> we only got one email after like a week of posting we're like i'm sure you guys get like hundreds of emails a day now yeah <laughs> which we get, it's very we funny get a lot of email. something a couple years old and be like please send us emails no one's sending emails <laughs> and now you'll probably be like send us fewer emails please <laughs> right right for a while we had people sending us packages and we finally had to be like don't please don't send us any more packages Ooh. it was cool it was like people were sending us like fun weird gifts and things but mm -hmm. it was also like we felt really guilty that like we don't want you to spend money on stuff for us. Like right. we're fine. <laughs> yeah. And, and something I'm sure like, as I get older, you run out of room for stuff. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. And like, we've gotten some great things, like really funny things that like really clever. We have like awesome fans who like mm -hmm. make cool stuff. I'm always happy to receive it, but I also, it also felt like, it felt like begging for people to give us things felt really weird after a while. <laughs> yeah, like Potterless has a P.O. box as well. And I I don't talk about it often, but like it's on the website under contact. Right. They'll watch YouTube videos and they'll be like, like, subscribe, send me things in my P.O. box, like all this shit. It's like if someone goes through the effort of going to my website and going to the contact section and then seeing the P.O. box and then sending me stuff like that's cool. Yeah, absolutely. And all the things that I've had are awesome. Like I've gotten a Tartan notebook because I shit talk Tartan on the podcast <laughs> once because I was like, it's just plaid, right? And then someone Scottish, Rachel Guthrie, who listens was like, actually, no, it's important. And here's a notebook about it. Or like people that's send cool. me pins like that's super cool. But yeah, I don't want to be to the point where I'm like, please send me things in my P.O. box. Like uh, if you go through the effort tight, otherwise I'm going to run out of room for stuff. I live in New York. My apartment is so small. Oh, I've had yeah, to put don't. up like four shelves just so I can like put things on walls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't need any more stuff. I'm happy for people to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's great. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and speaking of enough. listening, if people want to listen to you and, and follow you on the internet and stuff, where can they go? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at more people happy, uh, which is a handle I got when some, uh, my account got hacked by some uh, some Korean person. So Whoa, I kept no. it. No, I was like, this is the best gift ever. More people happy. Uh, is Look the at perfect you thing. and Jeffrey Craner both having he has at happier man. The pod oh. podcasters are so nice and happy. We did it. Uh, you can also fo follow my characters. Twitter at Usador the Blue mm -hmm. on Twitter, which is fun and it's silly and good. dumb. I gotta say, shout out to you for finding a way through acronyms and initials <laughs> to get the entire intro of Usador in the whatever maximum character space is in a Twitter bio. That is a feat of its own. <laughs> I spent more time on that than I care to admit. <laughs> It's very good. <laughs> yeah, but uh, go listen to Hello from the Magic Tavern anywhere you get podcasts. Uh, I also do on a show called Improvised Star Trek, which has been going on for many, many years, where I play a fictional, similar kind of like comedy take on Star Trek, but I'm the captain of the ship called the USS Sisyphus. Oh, very and, nice. Yeah. Uh, and I'm also, uh, second season of my podcast, The Probe, should be coming out soon, Ooh. Uh, if not already by the time of this uh, this release. Sweet. Awesome. Cool. Well, Matt, thank you so much for joining. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. I'm very excited to discuss Gringotts in the next one. But until then, as they say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, before they... Uh, bef before they have a, a really cool conversation behind closed doors in the kitchen with Harry Potter. <laughs> Wizard on! 
If you love Potterless and you need people to talk about it with, but none of your friends listen, well, first, you could tell your friends to listen, but second, you could go check us out on social media, whether it's Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, the private fancy Facebook group. There's a lot of different and great online Potterless communities where listeners can get together and talk about stuff. Check out all of them. If you want the links, I'm about to say them in the credits. Potterless is created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert, as well as Leanne Davis, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Jesse Horgan, Natalie Klobuchar, Deborah Wilkins, Klaus Sir Lopu, Rebecca Adamek, Frank Giotto, Marchismo, Tori Larsic, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfilio, Jenna Dowsett, Kieran Webb, Abita Med, Caitlin Jordan Pontolo, Rosemary Dodge, Jill Boulay, Maria Lisa C. Keen, Ariel Bird, Romina Rivdanira, Camille Doc, Russell Dunk, Dustin Roland Cooch, Audra, Eleanor Curlin, Sydney Cawthorn, Billy Hinton, Ross Ann Batamana, Andrea Franz, Nikita Power, Lala Palmer, Chelsea Green, Taylor Armstead, Love Cash Longer, Ali Madsen, Cassandra Aponte, Roxy Chaos, Amelia Krauss, Sean Montag, Sarah Nink, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Jessica Ann, Arnica the Daughter, Tiago Costa, Jessica Jacob, Orchid Grower, Steve Trillor, Vivian the Owl, Takaria Ront, Haley Hastings, Marino, Moster, Pinky Pan, Angelina Withred, Rosemary Heisig, Lee Ganji Singh, Alex Bisholta, Brian Williams, Caitlin Sullivan, Finn Stuckey, Musin Siddiqui, Grace Riggle, Sammy Shaw, Raul Pineda, Ingan Oddstadter, Mary Wynn, Brianne Wingate, Alexandra Consulver, John Kotker, Jenna Juice, Noel Basile, Tao, Emily Tyrell, Michael Russell, Robin Fernandez, Patricio Colon, Will Barrington, Liz Bigelow, Mariah Noah, Brandon Pickens, Sarah Enslin, Claire Spencer, Teal, Cena Schutzberg, Rory Collier, Gloria Gillum, Sarah and Patrick Dunvon, Alicat29, Haley Bowen, Veronica Bartova, Kevin Hernoy, Lada B, Noah, Tracy Toya, Lucinda, Carlos Nino, Pam Webb, Colleen King, Jennifer Marklu, Frida J. Svedson, Ivor Peterson, Naomi Googly. Elmo, Tyler Latshaw, Summer Rathel, Heather Fleischman, Vera Cullithan, Carrie D. Baggison, Andrea Kroc, Elisa Grieven, Lynn Walker, Emily Gale, Ryan King, Cameron Watkins, Justin Montero, Christine Saunders, Jacob Parrish, Toothless Walnut, Weekend of Dead Cat Ladies, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, Kimberly Savage, Surgeon Thanme Gupta, Brittany Gutierrez, Nada Atabani, Tumnus Moran, Remy Fontaine, Matt Sferly, Sarah Shecker, Lauren Cook, Nova VM, Kyle, Zena Rosnowski, Emily Tilly, Colleen Mage, Harlan Haskins, Akaksha Saxena, Wouter Vandermaiden, Shelby Darnell, Noelia, Reese Clark, Adriana Cox, Brian, Yukami Beats Waffles, Wash and Large, Jenny Campion, Nikki Harris, Kara Hamilton, Dorcas Courtney Hemwood, Kine Roan, Amanda Alfred, Sabrina Lauren Cook, Claire Chellner, Elisa McLaren, Kafir Shaltiel, Skymart Six, Sarah Shetter, Peter Vostanak, Yash Patel, Marta Morrison, Stephanie Magnuson, Justine Wade, Aaron Richter, CJ Ochoco, Aileen Jesh, Kate L. Dobbs, Violet Sullivan, Hannah Suzanne Gormley, Kat Yowl, Lindsay Towning, Elizabeth Agathon, Fielding Lee, Keegan Curran, Miranda Manning, and Can't I Potter? Web designed by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campamanas. If you want to find us on social media, you can go to Facebook.com slash Potterless, Twitter.com slash Potterless Pod, Instagram.com slash Potterless Podcast or reddit.com slash r slash Potterless. You can find a bunch of fun information about the show as well as other podcasts that me, Mike Schubert, has guessed on at potterlesspodcast.com and you can get bonus content over at patreon.com slash Potterless. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Feel free to tell people about it or give it ratings on iTunes if you want. No big deal. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, a wizard on.